Welcome to Democratic Television, a program of the Santa Clara County Democratic Party that brings insights, perspectives, and attitudes of our always thoughtful guests. Today we're joined by the Honorable Richard Loftus, a judge of the Superior Court, uh, and we have a lot of things to talk about. Uh, judge Loftus, thanks for being on Democratic Television. Thank you for inviting me. Um, we have a number of things to talk about. There's a lot going on in our uh, criminal justice system and the courts and what can we do to make them better. Those are some of the things that we'll address. Uh, before we get to that, though, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? Uh, did, you, uh, did you have interesting motivations, uh, interesting pets? Well, I, uh, I grew up in the city of Detroit. Oh. And uh, my, my father was a policeman in the city of Detroit for his uh, career. And uh, I went to undergraduate school at the University of Detroit, got a master's there uh, in economics, and then I went to the University of Michigan Law School um, and uh, graduated. In between my undergraduate and, and uh, my law school, I was a high school teacher for a couple of years oh. in Michigan, uh, which ha I, had an I have an, had an interest in uh, ever since. But uh, after law school, I, I uh, went into the practice of law uh, in Michigan for a period of time and then uh, uh, decided to relocate to California uh, back in 1975 and uh, came to San Jose um, and practiced law in San Jose uh, from 1975 until 1998. And then in 1998, I was appointed to the bench and have been on a, a judge since that time. Oh, okay. So growing up, did you have any uh, interesting uh, influences, things that said uh, the uh, choice uh, for you will be a career in law? Well, my dad obviously had mm -hmm. an influence on me, and he had two brothers who were also police officers, and uh, my grandfather was a police officer, so oh. the, the, the area of the law was uh, uh, an interest of mine um, in, in that regard. and. Uh, uh, back in the 1960s, uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, the whole idea of law and, and uh, uh, what was going on and, and uh, during the Kennedy administration was interesting to me and, and kind of prompted me to think about that as a career. And when I, I knew, always knew I wanted to be a lawyer, huh. and uh, uh, when uh, uh, my wife, uh, after I got married uh, and uh, she got pregnant uh, with twins, oh. I decided that was the time I had to go to law school or I wasn't <laughs> going to go. And so uh, she had twins the night before I started law school. Oh, and, gee. And so uh, we struggled during that three year period of time, but then all things worked out after that. So, uh, but that was, uh, I always wanted to, uh, to be a lawyer, I thought, after uh, uh, watching my dad's career and uh, the interesting time that I lived in it then. Did you catch a little To Kill a Mockingbird or other influences? Well, I'm sure I did, but I, you know, I don't know that I could say that that or any particular thing was an influence on me. Uh, certainly, uh, the idea of being a lawyer was always attractive to me. Was it a, a social justice thing or, you know, getting to the truth of an issue or uh, fairness? It's a long time ago. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember that there was any particular interest, other than the fact that I felt uh, an overwhelming sense that the law was providing order in our society, okay. and and that uh, was a real attraction to me because I felt that it was a time where we had a certain amount of lawlessness going on. Uh, my dad was in charge of the West Side of Detroit when they had the riots, and oh. it was a, it was a lawless time. And I just had the sense that, that you needed to have order in your society, and the lawyers uh, and the law system was, was what made that uh, happen. Mm. Okay. So you uh, moved to the San Jose area, were an attorney, and while you practiced law, did you get involved in the community in other ways? And I, I did. Oh. I did. I, uh, uh, I got very active with my kids. Uh, I have uh, seven kids, and they... Uh, that may be a show in itself. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, every day is a, uh, an adventure. Uh, but I, I got active with them in terms of uh, helping them in school and in coaching them and, and uh, getting active in their schools. Uh, I was on a, a school board for a while, and then I also was on the board at Mitty High School for a while and, uh, and also became uh, active in the Bar Association, mm. was president of the Bar Association for one year and uh, got active in uh, 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 Loaves and Fishes, which is a, a, a 
entity that uh, serves people uh, meals. And uh, so, I, yeah, I, I got active in that. And, and uh, the reason I decided to become a judge was I saw uh, judges as a part of that system that, hearkening back to the order in our society, uh, judges have a real influence on, on ha what happens in our society. And I thought that I could make a contribution that way. And I felt that that was important to do. I, I was somewhat disappointed in the direction that the practice of law was going in, that it was becoming a much more of a commercial enterprise as opposed to when I thought the reasons I joined it, which was more collegial in, in its sense. But uh, uh, the, the uh, justice system as a judge it gave me opportunities to uh, make a contribution. And I've found it to be a, a very rewarding career because, uh, first of all, when you become a judge, um, it's an education because you see things from a different perspective. And uh, you have to, uh, we have an e excellent education program for judges, uh, but also uh, it was a learning uh, thing for me because uh, shortly after I became a judge, I was assigned to family court. Oh. And um, one of the things that I came to realize was that there was this uh, terrible problem in our community with regard to domestic violence. And uh, we have a number of judges who spend their time dealing with cases of domestic violence. And uh, it was a perspective that I just didn't know about what, before I became a judge and recognizing that what, how pervasive it is in our society and what a problem it is. So did you request to be in family court or how does that process of assignment work? Well, uh, we have a kind of a Byzantine assignment system that we've worked out among ourselves. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we make requests of the presiding judge each year, the, the person that's the presiding judge, to, uh, as to what we'd like to, to serve. And uh, uh, the short answer to your question is, the first time I went there, I went there uh, not by my own choice. I was assigned. And then once I was there for a period of time, a couple of years, I was asked if I wanted to stay there. And I said yes, because I felt that it was something that I could make a contribution towards. My understanding of family court is that it's uh, very emotional, emotionally wrenching, and uh, folks are there, and it's just right. hard, very hard. Right. And, and you see things like domestic violence and uh, folks not getting along, and you worried about the kids. Uh, that's true. Uh, it is a, uh, a place where we sometimes say we see good people on their worst day. And uh, it, whereas in criminal court, you see bad people on their best day. And uh, in, in family court, uh, the, most of the cases get resolved uh, without too much acrimony. And most of the cases happen that way. But the cases we spend our most time with are those where the parties just can't get along. And there's issues there that belie resolution in a simple way. So you spend your time with people who are really uh, dysfunctional in some fashion. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a hard assignment for a judge because you are asked to be um, in charge and, and in most of the people that come there are not represented by lawyers. So you not only have to provide them with a resolution of their case, but also an education as to what the law is that it might apply to them. An instant education because I know you have caseloads. Right, right, uh, that's so right. So many folks coming up behind. And, and there's people who come to us in, in our particular county uh, from other cultures where they just don't buy into some of the things that we have as mm. laws, uh, you know, in terms of, and, and, and when you look at it, you look at a, a case of divorce where parties sometimes are struggling to get along financially, and then they come together and say, well, we're now going to have two households instead of one, and you say, well, the support system says you should pay this amount, and they say, well, I can't afford that. Well, you were struggling before, and now you have two places to support instead of one, so it's, it's sometimes a education for the parties and they find it very difficult to come, come to grips with some of those things. Now, you as a judge in these circumstances, do you, you say you get a good education and training. Do you get to know what the social service network is out there and do you specifically make recommendations or? Yes. Do you have a team of social workers that back your place? We have Family Court Services, which is a group of people that assists us in trying to deal with parties that have problems dealing with their uh, divorce or their d dissolution, as we call it, and, and, and custody and visitation. And that's probably the most difficult part of it. I mean, 
the, the issue of how to divide the property among the par parties is relatively straightforward in terms of what the law provides. But in terms of issues of custody and visitation with children, that's a much more challenging thing because, you know, there are some rules that we have to follow, of course, but some of it is just a matter of, of being the person who is responsible about what's in the best interest of the children. Yeah, that I'm sure could be very difficult. Yes. You mentioned domestic violence, and I know you've had an interest in trying to help educate the community about that. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, after my term in family court, I ended up in juvenile court, and I uh, realized we had one of the first, if not the first, uh, juvenile domestic violence calendars in the country. Uh, where we recognized that there were juveniles who were perpetrating domestic violence with, even in high school at, at that age. Oh. And they were learning this, of course, from their families, which is what some, one of the problems was. Uh, and what happened was I, I recognized that the, most of this was because of a lack of understanding about relationships in terms of w how the relationship should, should work in a high school environment. Uh, for example, we'd have... Uh, uh, people, kids in high school who would say, you have to wear my letter jacket, or you have oh. to do this for me, you have to do that for me. And, and, and it's power and control, as you know, in terms of what that means. And that relationship was being built in, in high school. And one of the reasons that I got very interested in this was because I realized that uh, domestic violence is also uh, a cause of a number of homicides. And ultimately, if you look at those homicides, you realize that many of them, the person, the victim, met their perpetrator in high school. And that relationship continued until such time as they ultimately uh, were a victim. Mm. Uh, so I thought that it was important to try and get early on education of, of juveniles with regard to what domestic violence is and what relationship should be like. Got it. So we're going to take a little break. When we come back, I'd like to hear specifically what you came up with. And uh, Judge Loftus, I think this is going very well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll take a little break. Hi, my name is Dave Cortezzi. I'm the president of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. A lot of people come to me day in and day out asking, how can I get involved? How can I make a difference in my community? Well, one of the things you can do is contact the local Democratic Party. As a lifelong Democrat, I know that that's one of the most inspiring and useful things you can do to help people, especially people who can't stand up for themselves. If you'd like to do that, there's a couple of ways to contact them. You can use their phone number, 408-445-9500, or go to the Democratic Party website, www.sccdp.org. If you want to make a difference, there's probably no better way than contacting our local Democratic Party. Thank you. Welcome back. We're here today with Judge Richard Loftus talking about uh, the justice system and uh, frankly I think some uh, things that we might be able to do to improve it. When we took our break you were talking about uh, the incidence of domestic violence you saw as a juvenile court judge and uh, you have some things that were suggested that may help deal with some of the problems. Right, I was fortunate that uh, I knew a, a superintendent uh, of schools in Campbell High School District, Rhonda Farber, who uh, introduced me to a group of teachers there who were English teachers who were interested in trying to promote the idea of educating students about domestic violence issues. And those uh, teachers worked over a summertime and developed a curriculum using works of literature where domestic violence was an issue in those and using that literature to uh, teach the children, the students, about domestic violence. Uh, uh, the Joy Luck Club uh, the, uh, uh, and some other classic pieces of literature uh, that they used as uh, lesson plans. And they developed lesson plans for that. Ultimately, we got together with the uh, uh, Markala Center for Ethics at Santa Clara and brought in the curriculum directors from the various high schools Gave, shared with them the curriculum that we had developed at, at Campbell uh, for them to take back to their own school districts and, and use to help educate students about domestic violence. So this is a, a unique way to develop curriculum because I think anytime you want to change curriculum it's a real big deal and not necessarily met with enthusiasm just because it's such a shift. You came up with something frankly more clever. 
Well, it was something that the teachers actually developed, and, and they should get full credit for it because they figured out a way of working it into the regular curriculum they had in terms of dealing with their own uh, teaching and, and being able to use it as a lesson for them. And it's very powerful because uh, many of the students uh, came up to those teachers afterwards where they were more comfortable with talking to them than they would an outside speaker uh, about domestic violence and how it might affect their life. And we gave, shared with the teachers as part of that curriculum, resources that they could refer the students to. So it was a, it was a helpful thing for a lot of those kids. That sounds great. Something that you did uh, just because of your interest in the community and what you're seeing in your courts. What are some of the other things that you've seen in your years on the bench that perhaps need some uh, addressing? Well, um, after the uh, juvenile mental health thing, then I went into the adult mm. system, and I was uh, fortunate to be appointed w to a task force put together by the Judicial Council of California to work with professionals. There were 42 of us that got together and brainstormed over a period of three years about ways to change the way the mentally ill are dealt with in the justice system in California. Uh, we are obviously, it's now conventional wisdom that we've demonized and over-incarcerated people who are mentally ill in the justice system, and we needed to change the way we, we de deal with the mentally ill so that we don't end up with them in, in custody. You know, the history is that uh, back in the 1960s, John Kennedy actually was the one that initiated the idea of closing mental institutions and instead opening community-based programs for people who are mentally ill so that they wouldn't be in custody. Well, as it turns out, uh, those same people, because we didn't really follow through in opening the community-based programs, they ended up in jail. So we have about the same percentage of our society in custody now as we did with mental institutions, but instead of being in mental institutions, they're in jails. And jails are not a very good place to treat people with mental illness. And in fact, they recidivate at a much higher rate than, than other people that are in that system. So we're trying to figure out ways. We uh, Part of the task force effort has been to get our justice partners together, uh, probation, the sheriff, uh, the mental health uh, uh, departments, the behavioral health departments, to work together with the courts in terms of trying to give people treatment as opposed to incarceration to keep them out of custody and be able to treat them in the community. Now, uh, if I were hearing this and thinking, here's a great idea, I'd think, well, that sounds very expensive, and how can we afford to do something like that in this day and age of limited budgets? Well, actually, it's not expensive because what happens is, is you redirect your resources in a different way. It's very expensive to keep people in jail. And, and rather than spend something like $50,000 a year to keep somebody incarcerated, we can instead treat them in the community at a much lower cost and keep them out of custody and, and give them treatment. Uh, and further, there, it's a complicated problem because people who are mentally ill oftentimes are down on their luck. Uh, they, they don't have housing, they don't have other resources, they don't have enough assets, and they don't necessarily have their own support systems because there's this huge stigma about the mentally ill. Yeah. Most mentally ill people can be very comfortably and safely kept in the community. There are a few who cannot be, and those people certainly have to be incarcerated or kept in custody. But uh, Los Angeles recently put together a task force to look at the same kind of problem, and the Los Angeles uh, Board of Supervisors put together a package of $100 million uh, uh, going forward to build housing and, and promote resources where people that are mentally ill can in fact be treated in the community and building resources like making sure that all of the uh, people who go out to see people who are challenged about mental illness have resources that are available to them so that they can in fact stay in the community as opposed to being in jail. The Los Angeles County Jail is the largest mental health institution in the world. There's 5,000 mentally ill people in the Los Angeles County Jail. And they realized that they needed to change that picture because it's expensive and it's, it's resource uh, uh, wasteful in terms of doing that. And, and other communities, each community is a little bit different in terms of the resources and in terms of how they deal with these issues. But each community, if they decide they want to do this, need to come together and figure out not working in silos, not saying that's not my job, that's something you have to deal with, then they, ca they can, in fact, make a real impact in the way that we deal with this. So what's it like being a judge now without those kinds of resources? Are you playing social worker in many cases? 
Well, what we do as judges now is we try to pull these things together, and we try and get people uh, out of custody. Uh, for example, people that I see in my court that have committed an offense that's a misdemeanor, something that really isn't going to keep them in custody for very long, what I try and do instead is send them over to a place where they get assessed as to what their needs are and put on probation for a period of time so that they can, in fact, as part of their conditions of probation are, they have to go to treatment, they have to take their medication, they have to come back to court and report on how well they're doing. So we can, we can do that, and, and we've reduced the population in the jail by doing it that way. And I know they're looking to uh, rebuild the jails. It sounds to me like there are things they could do there to be more readily accepting of people with mental health issues and things like that. To right. Th th that's true. Th they, we certainly need to be, do this smarter than we have in the past. Uh, fortunately, one of the aspects of Proposition 47 is that some of the dollars that are saved by reducing the jail population are earmarked for dealing with the mentally ill in our, in our communities. And so some of those resources can be directed in that fashion so that we can continue to keep people out of custody and have them be living in, in the community in a more uh, thoughtful kind of way. So you're saying that this isn't a pipe dream. This is actually happening in Los Angeles, as you say, the Briz's biggest, one of the largest counties in the country, uh, certainly with a huge population. Correct. And, and, and it's nationwide. I mean, the, the, the effort to reduce the number of mentally ill and those with co-occurring disorders, because keep in mind that about 75 or 80 percent of the mentally ill have some kind of substance abuse problem. They, they uh, treat themselves with medic self treat with medication by by doing illicit drugs uh, they end up with those kind of offenses and so c dealing with people that have a substance abuse issue and a mental health problem is part of the 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 effort that is being made the president re recently uh, recognized that the US attorney general has rec recommended that we uh, do the sentencing guidelines differently the the uh, police chiefs have now have an initiative to do deal with the same kind of thing so it's it's a nationwide recognition that what we've done in the past hasn't been effective in terms of dealing with the mentally ill in our justice system. So this now is no longer a case of a few enlightened people such as yourself saying we have a great concept and you say it's happening everywhere, maybe uniquely tailored for the community. Correct. I think that the communities, uh, our society as a whole has now recognized that what we have failed in the past to, to realize that we haven't done this in an effective thoughtful kind of way and so we need to deal with this differently locking people up I mean we have five percent of the world's population and 25 percent of the people in custody in the world and and we've over incarcerated the people in our society and it's had implications that are long term in their effect it's going to take us a long time to fix this because it took us a long time to get where we are but we have to make efforts in that direction. And the first thing that has to happen is a recognition that what we've been doing is not a good idea. We need to do something more thoughtfully in terms of how we move forward. But your point about President Kennedy saying we need a two-part process, get people out of prisons and then have uh, services when they get out. Not prison. They, they were mental institutions. Men, mental institutions. And, they, and then they were going to go to local treatment centers. That didn't happen. So people have always had a sense of what would work. Right. That was always the, the plan. And, and uh, I think we're going in that direction now. Uh, but it's taken us a long time to get there. Um, what roles do you play in terms of getting out to the community and speaking to uh, different groups to enlighten people? Is that something you're trying to do more of? Or? Yes. Yes. Uh, we, uh, I'm chair of a statewide task force on the mentally ill uh, put together by the Justice uh, uh, Judicial Council. And uh, we uh, have partnered with any number of different groups to try and promote the idea of having this happen in a co more collaborative fashion. Uh, we've met with the sheriffs, we've met with the uh, mental health directors, we've met with the probation chiefs, uh, and uh, I've gone out and s spoke with the uh, community uh, organizations like the National Association of the Mentally Ill, and and we and we've also, by the way, uh, totally revised the education system for judges with regard to dealing with the mentally oh. ill that come in their courtrooms because we not only see people who are mentally ill in ju in the criminal courts but we see them in family uh, because some of those intractable cases we talked about 
uh, those are people that sometimes have people who have mental illness that need to have part of that as part of their system. So we need to have judges who are sensitive to that. We also see that in dependency court where we have parents who are not doing what they should be doing because of mental illness problem. We have juveniles who are mentally ill that we have to deal with as well. So all across the board, we're trying to revise the curriculum for judges so that judges are more sensitive to dealing with people who have mental illness in their courts. You mentioned NAMI. Uh, I wanted to ask you, we have about a minute left. Are there resources people can turn to to look into this a little bit more? Yes, the National Association of the Mentally Ill, NAMI, N-A-M-I, uh, have local chapters in virtually every county in the, in the state, in the, in the country, and uh, NAMI is a good resource for people who are interested in having uh, to learn something about how to deal with the people who are mentally ill in their, in their family. And, and keep in mind that in terms of statistically, about one in every 10 people in this country has some form of mental illness, and about 6% uh, of everybody has a serious mental illness. So, so many families are touched by mental illness, and they need to be, know about the resources that are available to help them. I know in Santa Clara County, we have a program, 211, that's a great uh, thing for people to make a call, 211. The operator will ask what the problem is and then find the services that are available. So, well, you've given me a real sense of hope, Judge. I hope that uh, we can make some of these things happen uh, sooner rather than later. Right. Well, we're going to continue to work hard to make that happen. It took us a long time to get where we are. It's going to take us some time to make sure we fix these things or do our best job to fix those well, and make a difference. Sounds like a great program. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching Democratic Television. Give us a call at 408-445-9500 or visit our website, sccdp.org, and help us work on this difficult and challenging problem. Thank you very much.